I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around. talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, so oh Christian, lift up and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who see Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. Amen! He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. to number 222. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Oh, yeah. All right. 222, 1, 2, and 5. There is a fountain. Amen. All right. I'll just say that. We'll sing the rest because I know you guys want to sing it. All right. This is our praise here. This is how we get in the spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go 1, 2, and 5. 1, 2, and 5 for time's sake. All right. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. Lifestyle. 
Good sound drops in that song. You want to sing all those verses. Amen. All right. Let's go. Uh, brother Stan, can I ask you to say open your prayer first? Yeah. Come on, brother. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank, thank you, you so Amen. much for sending your son to take your wrath upon him. Yes, and thank you, Lord. Uh, Amen. Lord, we are not worthy. We are That's just right. dirt That's and right. nothing without you. Yeah. Uh, we deserve your punishment, but I pray for your mercy, Lord. Please Amen. protect this church, protect this service, and Amen. protect all of uh, the Christian who come uh, might come here, Lord, please uh, do not let destruction That's be good, here and please yes. send Holy yes. Ghost yes, and uh, help us praise you, Lord, and help yes. us praise you and help, uh, help us glorify not only on Sundays but through the whole week and That's every, good. Yes. Lord, That's good. every Amen. deed we do, Lord. And I pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you may have a seat. Please pull out your white hymnals. White hymnals. And I think it was number 33. 33? And can it be? Yeah. Yes, sir. There it goes. All Here right. Go. So 33. And can All it be? Right. Let's go ahead. <laughs> and we're going to go one, one, three, and five. One, three, and five. Right. Yeah. There we go. I, I guess you guys would never guess that. I heard one, one, three, and five. I heard one, yeah. two, five, brother. Yeah. <laughs> All <laughs> right. <laughs> Here we go. One, ready. And can it be that I should gain an interest? Love. 
brethren. Thank you for all visitors, all returning people. I love all of you guys. Also for online members, we're watching you. I say this every time we're watching you. Thank you for watching. Amen. Hope you're getting a blessing out of the preaching. Before I give the address, uh, let me just first tell you about Monday's discipleship. By the way, that's tomorrow, um, 7 p.m. at Pastor's Place, uh, 8 p.m. If you need the address, please ask him or me, and then I will give it to you. Um, so next Sunday, we're moving to the new building, and we're going to have Sunday street preaching at 10 a.m. this time, not 10.30. It's going to be 10. Um, just meet up at the church, and then we'll figure out where to go. It's, it's just a light basically right next to church. So here's the schedule, what's going to happen next Sunday. Uh, so we're going to have street preaching uh, from 10 to 11 is what I'm guessing. We usually do in an hour. Our memory verses are going to be, it's going to be a review review of Psalms 119. And it's going to be verses 104 to 105 and 160 and 165. So please remember those from the bulletin. Um, and as once you re review them, we're going to move on to a new verse next week. Brother Chris, if you can open up the offering with the word of prayer. Yes, <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you very much for your, our salvation. If it weren't for that, we would not know the joy and determination and the Amen. Lord, your, your purpose in each and one of our lives. Yeah, amen. Father, uh, it's truly a blessing to see new faces come into this. Amen. Every Sunday it seems like there's a new face coming. Uh, a lot of joy in my heart. Just Amen, brother. People are still seeking you out, especially in these times that we live yes, in. Yes, sir. And, um, Father, we are, we want you to let them know that, you know, our tithing, this is just from the heart. It's That's not, it. It has nothing to do with salvation. No. They will not be judged based on what they give. It's That's good. The heart. And we just ask that you bless this, this offering today. And, you know, if, uh, Amen. Amen. That's Still right. Amen.
<clears throat> Look at John chapter 6. We will read verse 24, please. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. Jesus answered them, and excuse me, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did, did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Jump to verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verse 61. The Bible reads right here, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Verse 66. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You will notice in this passage that the people came to listen to Jesus preaching, not because of his preaching, and not because of his miracles, but because he gave them free food. Because he did a miraculous thing of feeding the 5,000. So they had free food that time. So the people, they enjoyed that food so much that they want to see Jesus again because of free food. But how many churches do you see where people come to church because they give a free food line. Amen. Free food yeah, line. Amen. That's how churches become bigger. Well, why is this church so small, Pastor? Very simple. We don't feed the flesh here. We don't That's do good. light displays, entertainment. I don't bring a lion in the cage in the stadium. And I'm not joking. The, the, the church called the cathedral did that. And they publicly posted that on their website without shame. So the thing is this, is that we're not all about that. Now, there's nothing wrong with having some things where we can have some accommodations and some fun, but to depend upon those things for you to attend church and to serve God, that's a fleshy thing. Yeah. Amen. And I want you all to understand that if you pay attention to the teaching of the Word of God, because I do some doodle on the whiteboard, that's a fleshy thing. Yeah. If you come to this church because you think that Pastor Kim is going to pull some tear-jerking illustration that will make you repent and get right with God, that's a fleshy thing. Yeah. Because you came to this church, why? Because of the brethren, they're really good? On, that's a fleshy on. thing. That's you got to realize this. You can't rely on serving God because of fleshy things. And the Lord will one day test your heart. He will take away your close friend in this church to see if you'll still stick to church. He will take away Pastor Kim's voice one day. And then Pastor, his voice will be monotone and boring. And he will test your heart to see if you'll still pay attention to the preaching and the teaching. The Lord God may take away this room that we're in. And we might rot out outside to see if you will still come to church. Will you serve God? Or are you serving God because there's something carnal involved? And let me tell you something. The title of my sermon today, which I'm warning you, <laughs> Carnality Brings a Bellyache. Let's pray. God, my Father, wash away my sins with your precious and most holy blood. Thank you so much for thy word. Where would we be without thy word? Where would we yeah, be amen. without the guiding of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, amen. Thank you so much uh, for brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I am very excited about the new... Uh, plan that we're going to go, that we're going to launch, and we look forward to your hand at work. We thank you so much for the visitors who came. <clears throat> let them know that they are loved. Amen. Let the members who've been attending here for years, let them know that they are loved. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will get the glory out of today's preaching. May hearts be repented, lives change. You know this is a sermon that I could best pull up from now. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless this effort. Wash away my sins with your blood. Fill within me the power of the Holy Spirit. May what come out of my mouth be God Almighty himself and not Gene Kim. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is when the feeling of the belly is good. When the feeling of the belly is good. We're going to look at verses 24 through 26. <clears throat> You'll notice right here that the people came because their bellies felt good. Because Jesus fed them. And you got to realize this is that's a carnal thing. Now let me give you an example where you can better understand what's carnal and what's spiritual. 
Now, when I was at uh, when I was at this one Bible believing church, this Bible believing church, I mean, I was so pumped up, I was so revved up. They had singing, uh, they had shouting, they had their hearts moved, and there were people who went on the altar, got right with God. There were brethren surrounding me that was so motivating where they loved Jesus Christ. They wanted to go street preaching. They wanted to knock on doors. They wanted to tell people how to get saved. Preachers were on fire. They knew how to preach well. They were great preachers. But then one time, my dad got on me, and then he said that that's so carnal. And I said, why? I mean, it's a great thing where people are, I don't know if you've been to Bible-believing churches, but there are people who just run around the aisles. There are some people who will stand on top of their seats. There are some people who will lift up their hands and say amen. Yeah. You'll notice that a little bit right here. Yeah. A lot of you experienced that at summer camp, yeah. and you saw how much that the Holy Spirit moved, that it moved your heart to serve God. But I'm going to tell you something like my dad told me. That's fleshy. That's carnal. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Let me tell you something why. Because so now you have the heart for God because what? People are shouting. Now you have the heart for God because there are people getting on the altar, getting right with God. Now you're like saying, wow, my heart is moved uh, by the preaching. Why? Because there's a new preacher that you never heard before. And he pulls up some really catchy illustration. That's all fleshy. The Holy Spirit, you must understand, can use people in a monotone point, in a monotone voice where there's no building, where there's nobody but just you and the pastor. The Holy Spirit will use those things and will you have the heart to love and serve Jesus Christ? So ask yourself this question. Why are you on fire for God now? Why are you now attending church more often now? Why are you now all of a sudden trying to come out so many? Because of a fleshy thing like summer camp like a big revival meeting we had like something in this church you gotta understand this you're no different from other people who go to large churches they attended those churches only because it appealed their flesh in some way they love the the band the orchestra that appealed their flesh they love the gimmicks and then they love the light displays they love the people there Oh, so then if there's something bad that happens in this church, you're not going to come back because of you don't have your friend there or so-and-so said something bad about you or you don't like the preacher on what he said? See, that those are all fleshy things. The Lord will test your heart to see if you're going to still read your Bible, pray, come out soul winning, when all the senses of your flesh just feels rotten, miserable, depressed. You got to understand that it's carnal, it's fleshy when you only serve God just because brethren encouraged you, just because there's a big revival meeting, just because God answered your prayer and he blessed you and you're like, wow, thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to come out to church. Now I'm going to get back to business to serving you. That's not right. That's fleshy. When you feel good, see, when the feeling of the belly is good, that's when you come to Jesus and you'll hear him preach. You'll have him minister to you. You might say, well, I don't think it's right that you serve God when your heart is in it, Pastor. So you're telling me that when I feel all miserable and I feel depressed and grumpy, I should still come to church. I should still serve God. Did in Colossians 3.23, which I agree, the verse says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. So yes, I agree with you. Your heart's got to be in it. But you got to realize this, is that who is the one that made your heart feel that way, not serving God? Who is the one that made your heart feel that way, not serving God? Oh, well, you know, uh, I don't feel like coming to church, and I'm gonna, just going to bring a bad spirit to the church when I come in, so I'm not going to come to church. I'm not going to go out soul winning. I'm not going to serve God. If you use that as an excuse, you got to realize this. Who is the one that made you feel that way if that's not God? Here's your answer. Acts 15, 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? That's the devil. You understand that's the devil. So you know what God wants? God wants you to put your heart in it when your flesh doesn't feel like it. That's the idea. Do you know how many times it's a good excuse for me not to preach to you at Sunday? Do you know how many Sundays there were that I didn't feel like preaching? That my heart was not on fire? That my heart was not in it? That I felt miserable and down? But yet the Lord still used those sermons to minister and touch people's lives. 
And you got to realize the Holy Spirit, he's in not how you feel. The Holy Spirit moves when he's doing the moving yeah, and you good. yield to him good. and you say, God, I don't care how I feel. You take control. Amen. You might say, but pastor, I don't know how I can keep serving God when I don't feel like it. And that's the number one thing I see with every single, and I mean every single person who comes to church. Whether you're lost, whether you're worldly, whether you're saved, whether you're backslidden, whether you're on fire for God. The number one problem I see with people is feeling, feeling, feeling. That's the key problem. So people can't keep serving God because they come through a time where they don't feel good. What are you going to do at that moment? It's hard to serve God. Pastor, can you tell me how I can overcome these feelings? It's really hard. I'll tell you what can overpower those feelings of depression, misery, indifference. It's a very powerful feeling. It's called fear. No matter how much it is, when you fear something, that emotion of fear will override any other feeling you have. Turn to 1 Kings 13. 1 Kings 13. You might say, where are you getting at, preacher? Bookmark John 6. We will come back there. Bookmark John 6. But go to 1 Kings chapter 13. I'll tell you what I mean. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes, I don't believe in terrifying people and then, you know, putting them into an oppressive state and force them to serve God. But you got to realize this. There are lines to be drawn and... You will even admit this too. Sometimes fear saved your life from doing stupid mistakes. Oh, I don't believe in that. Yeah, you would. When the sign says do not touch, you're going to get electrocuted. That emotion of fear saved your life from touching that fence. Fear saves your life. When you know that the Lord is going to beat the tar out of you when you sin, when you know that God, that sin has a price, that you will reap what you sow, that your younger generations will be watching you and following your example. Yeah. When you have that fear of the Lord in your mind, with, that you will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, mm -hmm. and God will judge you for every secret thing that you have done in your life, and you had that kind of fear, you're not going to go, oh, I don't feel like coming to church today. No, you're going to go, oh, the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, I got yeah, go to gotta go to church. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's good. Oh, but this drinking addiction is so hard. And my, man, uh, man, I don't feel like conquering the addiction. Man, I feel like drinking. Use fear. Yeah. Use fear. Pretend that as soon as you touch that drinking bottle, that lightning will fall out of heaven yeah. and that you will get fried. That's good. Then you try drinking after that. See, it's fear. Look at 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 4. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth this hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. Now look at verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now with the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Verse 7, the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Now, if you paid attention to these verses, look at the reaction of the king at verse 4. He was being a wicked king. He didn't care what the preacher said. He said, lay hold on him. But when God struck fear in his heart by putting him some kind of illness and ailment, the king automatically, it didn't matter what he felt. Do you think he had time to ponder and, well, I will serve Jesus later on. And, you know, I need to make my decisions and I'm going to get a clear schedule and I don't feel ready yet. Come and on. man, uh, I don't feel ready. I feel miserable. I need Jesus to show me. No, when he got fear, he's like, oh, listen yeah. to the preacher. Yeah, that's right. Oh, why don't you come to my house and I will serve you a meal? What, what happened all of a sudden? Maybe we'll get brethren all of a sudden say, Hey, pastor, what time is soul winning? What time is church? Hey, give me those tracks. Hey, what can I do to help out and to help out the members here or the pastor right here? What can I do to be a... You'll start suddenly doing that if God just struck you, perhaps. See, fear does something. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not recommending that emotion. I'm not saying that's the best thing to go to. You know what the best emotion is? Love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Love for Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. Because you're so fleshy, 
that you can't yield into the love of Jesus. You're so fleshy that you can't yield to the love of Jesus. The only solution that can help you with that feeling because you're just so fleshy is fear. Yeah, that's right. Because that's how wicked your flesh is. Now look at verse 33. All of a sudden, look at verse 33. Picture yourself. Verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the lowest uh, of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. Now, look at what happened. Not even ending the chapter. We didn't even end the chapter. Jeroboam sinned again quickly. I'll tell you why. You know why? Because when his hand got struck, the king said, will you ask God to heal my hand? And when God healed his hand, what happened? Then he went back into sin. Here's the point. He lost the fear when he got healed. You know why? You lose your fear of the Lord because his hand of ailment is not upon you. He gives you grace and mercy because his mercies are made new every morning. He loves you like he loves his only child. And every time that you sin, he lets you slide. He lets you slide. He lets you slide. He kept healing your life. He kept healing your broken home. He healed your prayers. He took care of you. God's been too good to you. So you lost your fear of God. I, shouldn't you love Jesus Christ more after that and serve him even more? Yeah. But no, you sin even more. You take the love of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross for you. What great, incredible love. And you took that as a license to sin. You took that as, I can do whatever I want. You took that as, I don't need to come to church. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to pray. I don't need to sow it. I don't need to quit that sin. Oh, you know, some of the things in the sermon, I don't agree. I'm not ready yet. You, you should stop that attitude. After Jesus Christ gave you a big love, precious love, that's not something you abuse and take as a license to sin. If God didn't die on the cross and saved you from hell, but rather said, I'm going to struck you with hellfire, 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 perhaps we would see more people getting saved, more people living clean, more people staying away from evil and serving God properly. But see, God's not that type of God because he wants love out of your life and not fear. But man, you are just so wicked and so fleshy. Sometimes fear would be a good thing. Maybe it was better off that God did that rather than giving us salvation for free. Maybe it would have been better that he didn't give free salvation and made you work for it. Made you say, well, if you do these sins, then uh, you're going to burn in hell. Then perhaps you would stop your addiction and start living clean. That's good. But see, God's love is greater than all your sins. His grace is greater than all your sins. So he just says, just come with a repentant, believing heart. Take my sacrifice at Calvary and no good works, no good works are required for eternity. No good works for salvation. It's a free gift. My son died. I mean, if you think that good works can save you, why did Jesus even die for you? My second point, when the feeling of the belly is gone, when the feeling of the belly is gone, return to our main text. Our main text. God's been too good to you, and maybe he should, uh, maybe he should let more suffering, affliction happen in your life so you can start living clean. He's been too good to you. Because your hand is healed and you lost the fear, but if he afflicted you, you would regain the fear and you'd start living right for him. Look at verse 27. Labor not for the meat which, what, perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, if you look at verse 27, you'll notice that Jesus is saying, don't work for the meat that is gone. So when the feeling of the belly is gone, you got to realize that it's gone, pretty much. You can't get it back. So why is it that you want to feel good when you got to realize it's gone? Feelings don't last forever. You think that once you tasted that sin that that feeling will last forever? No, it's gone. It's so temporary. You got to realize this. Our internet, YouTube, is temporary. That's right. Amen. 
One day the Lord's going to slow it down. I don't doubt that the Amen. Lord might slow it down. Yep. One day we might get out of the channel. One day the, uh, the Lord might do something where we're not big on YouTube anymore. It's temporary. You got to realize this is that my voice and uh, whatever youth the Lord has given to me to preach effectively, that's temporary. Yeah. I'm going to turn old and gray headed, even though I look pretty young right now, but one day I'm going to turn older and older. And then I can't preach as effectively, as powerfully as before. You got to realize this people in here, yeah, you're motivated to serve God, but if you've been here for years, people come and go. Come good, it's brother. temporary. Temporary. Are you still going to serve God? Why do you strive? Why do you waste your life on something that's temporary? So you serve that's Jesus it. Christ when there's something temporary good in your life? Don't labor for that which is temporary, but what? For eternity eternal Amen. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 set your affections on things above not on things on this earth yeah, gotta realize this that whiteboard is temporary but heaven is eternal you gotta realize this God answering your prayer is temporary yeah. but meeting God face to face is eternal Amen. Yeah, Amen. You, you gotta realize the good times with the brethren is temporary but the good time with the saints in heaven yeah. is eternal. Yeah, amen. 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 You got to realize that the possessions that God has blessed you, a nice house, nice clothes, a nice family, a nice spouse, nice children, a nice car, a nice area, good money, good job, a great school to study into. You got to realize this. Those things are temporary. But I'm going to tell you that tree of life is eternal. The angels are eternal. The streets of gold are eternal. The pearly gates are eternal. Your mansion in heaven is eternal. God Almighty is eternal. Amen. But what are you looking at when you come to this church? You keep looking at the building. Yeah. You keep looking at the people here. You keep looking at which subject Pastor Kim is going to teach on. You keep looking at temporary things. And you don't look at what God wants me. I came here because of the eternal things. To make my God proud of me for eternity. To get the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for eternity. You got to look at eternity. But you keep looking at the temporary. Yeah. One day, Pastor Kim, God forbid, God forbid, I'm not saying. But God forbid, Pastor Kim might sin and mess up. Then what are you going to do? You're going to quit serving God after that? Yeah. You're not going to come to this church after that? Do you know how many people leave church when the pastor messes up in something? Because they put faith on the pastor, not on Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. And if you amen. saw my sermons and teaching over and over again, I told you, don't you believe a word that I'm right, saying. Brother. you got to look at the Bible. You need to keep your eyes on yeah. Jesus Christ, not on Gene Kim. Amen. I'm very glad that the Lord put me at a position where a lot of people look up to me. And I really don't take that for granted. And I take that as a high honor and privilege. But that also puts the fear of the Lord in me. It takes my position more seriously because I know that I'm flesh and that the devil he'll do whatever he can to ruin my life and when that happens are you gonna still keep this church running are you still gonna uh, go out soul winning pass out tracks or are you gonna say oh because pastor Kim messed up Bible believing pastors always mess up so because of that I because of Bible believing pastors that mess up and how many atheists have I talked to there oh pastor so-and-so this pastor so-and-so messed up messed up so I quit being a Christian anymore so you can't you Lost your eyes. Lost your focus. It should be on eternity. It should be on Jesus That's Christ. Right, yeah. Not on temporary flesh. That's right. Temporary flesh. It's not worth it to sacrifice the temporary things for eternal. Can you imagine that? What? So you quit coming to church because of a temporary thing like a building. We don't have a building. Or let me give an a extreme example where the pastor messed up. That sounds like a really good one. A pastor messed up so you can't come to church anymore. So you give up, what, your gold, silver, precious stones in heaven then? You give up making a smile on Jesus Christ's face for eternity? You give up your eternal inheritance? What, just because of so-and-so here who's a sinner? Let's say you don't, let's say some of you guys didn't go to summer camp. Hmm? Let's say we don't have a revival meeting here or different preachers here that can stir up your spirit or the brethren here. What, so... You only sacrifice for the temporary things, right? That fellowship, those new preachers, that revival meeting, that atmosphere of shouting and loving Jesus Christ and people coming on the altar. What, you only give your life away for those things? Temporary? Temporary? What about the shouts in heaven? What about God saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I think those words are the best words more than any other sermon preached by 20 preachers combined. What are you looking at? 
temporary or eternal? You know why I know it's temporary? I know why. Because if I were to ask you questions about what was preached at summer camp, some of you would forget some of the things that were said, right? See that? Temporary. It's temporary. Oh, I wouldn't forget. Well, let me quiz you. You want me to quiz you on some of the sermons I preached last Sunday? Do you even know the title? Did you guys remember the title? <laughs> See that? <laughs> See that? So the point is you can't rely on temporary things. You got to look at eternity on eternity. Let me tell you something right here is that do you know what you're wasting your life on when you work in a job, when you make good money, when you focus on your spouse or your family member, when uh, in a revival meeting or when God answers your prayers or a nice church building or great preaching and teaching? You know where, 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 how long that time span is? Can you even see that? That little hole between my three fingers, can you even see that? That's all of it. That's all of your, that's all of it. Yep. Your money that you're making, the good preaching that you're going to hear, the nice church building, the great fellowship in this room, the school that you're working hard in, that's how long it's going to take. That small little hole. Compared to what, Pastor? Compared to the whole space in this room, which is eternity in amen, heaven. Amen. Yeah. This is good. You're, not, you're not spending your time on all this. You're, you're wasting your time on this. Yeah, that's you're serving Jesus, coming to church, loving Jesus, only doing something spiritual just for this. That's your problem. Just for this. Imagine, just because of a little thing, uncomfortable thing in this little hole here, you throw away your Christian life? So before you quit serving God and don't serve Jesus again, Remember this, you're throwing away this, you're, you're throwing away all this just for this. That's right. Just yeah. because of this, yeah. you throw away all of this. Yeah. Do you want to feel regret, shame, and sorrow when God rules on this earth for a thousand years in the millennium? A thousand years, I don't know if you know this, but when you're working for Jesus Christ, you get eternal rewards. Gold, silver, precious stones, treasures. You get five different crowns. You also, uh, that, that covers all different types. The soul winner's crown, the incorruptible crown, the crown of glory, the crown of life, etc., etc. You also get an, an uh, you also get cities to rule on this earth. Do you know how many billionaires are, and how many millionaires are just getting a portion of the city to own? But you rule not just one city, but cities for a thousand years. You're also going to get an inheritance of all things. And all things literally means all things. Everything of the universe in heaven and on earth. You're going to get all those things. Whatever those things is, the imagination can run wild. But you're wasting your life on just a fraction of right. the world right. when you're going to get more than all the world. And then the fifth thing, which is the greatest, is you made God proud of you. That's what you're going to get. Those five things, and that makes it worth anything that you can work hard for in this life. So can you imagine losing those five things? Whenever you feel, feel, whenever you feel like you're not serving God, remember the feeling of somebody else wearing your crown on his head for a thousand years long. Whenever you don't feel like serving God, remember the feeling of somebody who has cities to rule and you're practically homeless at the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years long. Remember that feeling. Remember the feeling when something bad happens in your life where people or God have been unfair to you or seemingly unfair to you and you remember that feeling. Remember the feeling for a thousand years long when you lose an inheritance of all things. See, the, those, remember, the fee, if you go by feeling so much, I want you to picture the feeling of a thousand years long when you lose all those things and somebody else gets your crown, gets your inheritance, gets your rewards, gets your cities to rule. Turn to Exodus chapter 15, please. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15. Do you know how many people I have seen in church? And I'm including myself too. I've been like... I'm no better than you. There are times that I've done this too. 
But do you know how many people I've seen? Once they hear the preaching, they're praising God and they're serving Jesus. They're so much on fire. And then what happens really soon after that? Then they go yeah. like that. Let me give you a great example. Look at Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. The children of Israel, they've been freed by the, ensla the slavery of Egypt. They've got freed. They're, they're a free nation. So they're rejoicing. They're so happy when God drowned out their enemies. Verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And then look at verse 21. And Miriam answered them, sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed glorious, gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So from verse 1 through 21, they're on fire. They're serving God. 21 verses long, you're on fire for God. 21 verses long, you're reading your Bible. 21 verses long, you're praying. 21 verses long, you're praising Jesus Christ. 21 verses long, you haven't skipped church or soul winning. 21 verses long. Look at verse 22, right after 21. The very next verse, okay? They were praising God just now at verse 21. Look at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into, in the wilderness and found no water. Only three days. Verse 23, And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it called Marah. Now look at the very next verse after that. And the people, what? Praise the Lord. Supported their pastor Moses. Went to church faithfully. No, murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? That's it. Look at this, man. Here you go on. Just three days. Just three days. Uh -huh. Are you reading this story yeah. right? Yeah. Just three days later, they're like, what? where's our drink? Why did you do this to us, God? What in the world, man? You've been enslaved by Egypt for more than 400 years. For crying out loud. You were in bondage for so many years and God just freed you and you're like, what? Why'd you do this to us, God? Now, before you think ill of the children of Israel, Jesus died and saved your life. And then after you hear the preaching and you're like, oh God, I get right with you. And then three hours after this preaching is over, three hours after this preaching is over, what do you do? Ooh, again. You go by feelings again. Yeah. You let God down again. You live like the devil again. You yield to your flesh again. You don't need three days. You just need three hours after this preaching is over. And you go back to the feelings, feelings, feelings again. Look at the verse 51 of John 6, verse 6. 51 of John 6. My last point, when the feeling of the belly is griping. When the feeling of the belly is griping. So when those feelings really gripe and cry out, you need to find ways to combat against it. You might say, preacher, I need help with this. Well, here are some things that I hope will help you. Look at verse 51. Notice Jesus Christ declared himself to be the living bread. Notice that in verse 52. The Jews, they were griping, even though he offered the bread. Look at verse 61. Jesus asked him, does this offend you? And yeah, verse 66, they don't come back to church again. Now, I'm going to tell you something is that you don't want to be like these type of people who are griping. And you got to realize this. When this church gets bigger and bigger, don't think we're all going to be a happy bunch. Come on. Like today on Sunday, oh, everything, everyone's getting along, you know. Oh, this is a great place. Happy place, happy place. Wait till we get bigger, okay? Then you're going to realize, is this a Bible-believing church? <laughs> That's what's going to happen. I want you to remember that because one day we're going to hit that point one day. And you got to realize this, is that when those feelings take over you, then are you going to get offended and walk out? And you don't come back to church again? Does it offend you? And no one followed him after that. Only 12 people stick with him, and one of them is a devil, man. All of them left the way. What are you going to do when you're griping? How you're going to have to, at that moment, when your feelings want to gripe, you have to come back against it. But you might say, it doesn't seem right, Pastor, to come to church when I don't feel like it. Can I? encourage you don't feel discouraged guilty when you come to church and you don't feel like it can I repeat that again 
I want you to remember this because discouragement and guilt has always been a factor the devil used That's so right. that you don't come back That's to church, right. so that you don't read the Bible when you don't pray. Amen. And you're going to remember this preaching. And when you remember this preaching, you're going to feel so guilty that, oh man, it's, I can't serve God even when I don't feel like it and I feel so bad. And you push yourself and you feel even worse after that. You get even more guilt after that because you remember what this preacher preached about and you're just going to get so much under conviction and you're going to beat yourself over the head. Man, I'm just so fleshy. I only serve Jesus because I'm fleshy. Why bother, you know? And then you'll just do it in depression and misery. So I want you to remember this. It's good that you don't feel good when you come to church. You might say, why is that, preacher? Because that's normal. The flesh should feel miserable yeah, when you do something spiritual for God. The amen. flesh should be killed and crucified and dead more and more when you try to serve God. Do you think the flesh will enjoy what the Spirit tells it to do? Or will the flesh resist the Spirit? See, so pat yourself on the shoulder, encourage yourself that, man, I came to church today even though my flesh said stay home. Yep. That's good stuff. And you should encourage yourself in that sense. Pat yourself on the shoulder. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, what? Dwelleth no good thing. But for to will is what? Present with me. See, there's something in you that knows you should still read the Bible. You should still come to church. You got to realize this. If you really hated church, hated Bible reading, why is it that you still come to church? Why is it you still read the Bible? That means there's something still in you, your spiritual nature, that wants to serve God. So even though you don't feel like soul winning, don't feel bad. Why did you still come to soul winning then, huh? Because there's something in you that wants to. That's the spirit. See, that spirit nature just needs to increase more. The flesh needs to experience more what it feels like to yield more to what the spirit desires rather than what the flesh desires. Sometimes street preaching is a fleshy thing and amen. The evidence is look at dumb YouTube videos. You know what riles them up more in street preaching is when they get a fleshy reaction from people and that reacts to their flesh and they want to yell back. That's a fleshy thing. I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, that's why it's a good thing that your flesh feels bad when you come to visitation church. You know how David served God despite of his feelings? We're not going to turn there for time's sake, but at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19 through 23, David, he just lost his child. And when he lost his baby boy, He felt miserable. He felt sad. But you know what he did? He cleaned himself off. He just ate and worshiped the Lord at the house. And people were so baffled. They're like, wait, you're just, your baby just died. Why are you rejoicing? But you know what King David said? He mentioned this. What good is it to weep? Is that going to bring my son back to life? Remember this. You know what helps you to serve God? Staying at home crying your eyes out, being all alone in your room and feeling miserable is not going to make things better. That's what you need to click in your head. You're not helping yourself, locking yourself up, up in home by yourself with no one to encourage you, no pastor to preach at you, no hymn to sing, no brethren around you. You're not going to make things better. That's what you need. When your flesh doesn't feel like serving God, you got to tell your flesh this, Doing this is not going to make me feel better. Yeah. It's not going to make things better. But there's another thing you got to realize that David did. First Chronicles 29, verse 12 through 14. You know what he says? I give thanks to you because you've done so many wonderful things for me, Lord. So you got to realize this. When you're being happy, thanking, and praising God... You should do it even when your flesh doesn't feel like it. It's a fleshy thing when... You praise the Lord when God answers your prayer. Did you hear that? It's a fleshy thing to praise the Lord when God answers your prayers, when good things are happening to this church, when you got somebody saved in front of your eyes, when, uh, you, uh, when God is blessing you with a lot of fruit, when God is richly physically blessing your life, when there are no sufferings happening in your life. It's a fleshy thing that you're serving God based on those things. It's a fleshy thing. 
You know why you should still serve God even when God doesn't give those good things to you? You know why you should still thank and praise the Lord? Because he's been more than too good to you. Yeah. And if he stopped his blessing right now, he's more than good to you. Do you know why? He saved your soul from hell. Amen. What more can he do for you? He lived 33 and a half years without sin. Yeah. Can you do that? He went through the beating, the whipping, the crown of thorns, gushed with the crown of thorns, nailed, crucified, hung naked on the cross. Can you do that? Jesus did that for you. He gave you eternity. Eternity in heaven. That makes up all of the lifetime of misery. What more can you want? What more can God be good to you? Based on those things alone, don't let the feelings say God is not good. Don't let the feelings say it's not worth it to serve God. Don't let the feelings overrun and say, oh, I don't want to serve God. No. Remember how God has been more than good to you. Because all you and I were, were no, worthless nobodies, wretched worms burning in hell forever. That's what you and I were. That's right, yeah. You and I were that. Just wretched worms burning in hell forever. So God's been more than good to you. Shouldn't that be enough to still praise and thank him, come to church, read the Bible, yes, pray, stay away from sin, and give him the glory? Amen. Now, this, my statistics can be wrong because I wrote this years ago. I, I'm sure things have changed. A thousand people a day commit suicide. 500,000 people a year commit suicide. Factors most commonly associate with suicide. Now think about this. Why do so many people commit suicide? Pay attention to these factors that contribute to suicide. Bereavement, social isolation, chronic illness, and drug addiction. If you paid attention to those factors, do you know what all those things have in common? Feelings. Feelings. A young secretary, true story, was going to jump off an 18-foot building. A minister tried to persuade her that life is worth the living. But sh that young secretary sure didn't feel like it. She felt miserable. Now, if I was that young minister, I could imagine what I would try to persuade her. That, you know, it's not really all that bad. Life is worth the living. The minister actually talked to her for one hour 60 golden minutes to beg her not to jump off the building. Can you imagine? I can imagine being that minister, using every, everything that you can think of to make them convinced that the joy of the Lord, there is truly joy in the Lord, and that your feelings shouldn't take over where you feel miserable. I would probably quote, man, Jesus loved you enough to die for you, free gift. Heaven is forever. Imagine what it's like to be in heaven forever. No more depression, no more misery, no more pain. Sure, you're going through hard times right now, but God gave a promise, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. God's going to work it out for good. Hey, you know, I'll be there for you. The Lord said that he will give you brethren to help you out. I'll be one of them. I can help you out through those problems. You can give me a phone call. Man, count all the blessings that God has done for your life. He promised that he will provide all your needs. He promised you that all things work together for good. He promised you that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. He promised you eternity up in heaven. He promised you that all things will work together for good. He promised you peace, abundant peace, no matter what the trials and the storms are. He promised you this, promised you that, and he can go on for all long, on and on and on, like I am with you. 60 golden minutes to convince her. Boy, if you were to list all the promises of God for one hour long, shouldn't that convince you? Shouldn't that convince you? That young secretary, I can imagine she heard such good things. So you can see that she would be convinced and she turned her body toward the minister, going away from the edge, seeing God's goodness. And then she said, it's no use. Life is not worth living. And she jumped off and <laughs> died. You know why she jumped to her death? It doesn't matter what powerful things or how convincing the preacher worded to make the person convinced that eternity with God, God's blessings, is worth more than this temporary feeling. She still died. And what I'm doing with you is I preached almost an hour. 
and I'm giving you 60 golden mi minutes to convince you about feelings, feelings and feelings. Don't let it drive you to suicide. That God is more than good to you. Amen. That you should give your life to Jesus Christ and serve him. I'm tugging at you. I'm tugging and I'm trying to beg and convince you. But I know how people are. They will just still go by feelings. You're still going to turn your back, jump off the cliff, and by the feelings of your flesh, the Bible promised, by the feelings of the flesh, it will kill you. Every head bow and every eye shut. Here's your altar call. Did I convince you? Was I able to persuade you? Did the Lord move your heart? Don't pray. Don't get right with God just because you feel like it. Because the Lord moved upon your heart. For some of you who are unfamiliar, what we do is that we give you a couple minutes to pray by yourself. You can pray in this altar's floor or you can pray in your seat. It doesn't matter. But we give you a couple minutes to give you some time to self-reflect and to ask God for help on what you learned from this preach. Some sins and some things you are struggling with for you to repent and get that right with God. You know what the past nearly 60 minutes were? Just words. Didn't I? I can't convince you. I can't persuade you. If you'll still let the feelings of your flesh override you. You're just, you're on that ledge. I feel bad for you if you just fall off. Nothing I say will convince you. Only you yourself can convince yourself. Only you yourself can get that right with God right now. Only you yourself can say, Lord, I repent. And I'm going to keep serving you. Brethren, revival meetings are not forever. I don't last forever. Will you still serve Jesus Christ? We don't need a new preacher here to get you back on track. We don't need some summer camp, some KJV Jubilee, some revival meeting to get you back on track. You need to make the decision yourself. Some of you perhaps don't know where you're going after you die. We always make sure everyone gets the opportunity to get saved. It'd be a bad thing that I didn't tell you how to get saved, and then I'll be held guilty showing you how not to go to heaven. So I'm going to give you a chance to get saved today. It, please answer this question honestly. If you're to die right now, are you 100% sure? Are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You might say, Pastor, I, I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if I can go to heaven after I die. Well, let me tell you something. It's so easy to get saved. Three simple things, that's it. Three simple things that you need to know to get saved. First, you've got to realize that sin has to be judged with hellfire. So the first point is you've got to realize you can't go to heaven because of sin. Sin is a problem. All right, pastor, then how do I get rid of my sin? Here's the second point. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. I'm sure you know that story. You heard that story a million times. But do you know why that story is so important? That story is so important because, remember, sin is why you go to hell, right? Remember that? Okay. The only thing that can wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus. See, that's why Jesus died, buried, resurrected. So his blood can come out and wash away every sin you've done. So here's the thing. All you have to do to get saved is if you repent as a sinner, because remember, sin sends you to hell. If you repent as a sinner and only rely on, just rely, just trust in the blood of Jesus, then you're saved. It's that simple. You might say, well, pastor, don't I have to clean up all my sins? Don't I have to live a good life? Don't I have to make some things right with God? And don't I have to be a good person and get baptized? No. Good works cannot save you. Because what can wash away your sin again? Remember? The blood of Jesus. It's not what you do. It's what Jesus did for you. His blood. Only that can save you. So you need to only rely on the blood. So 15 seconds or less, all you have to do is say to God, God, I repent as a sinner 
and only trust in the blood to save me. Isn't that easy? That's all you have to do to get saved. You might say, well, pastor, uh, I don't know how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, I can even give you the words on how to say it. And all you have to do is repeat after me. Now, every head is bowed and every eye is shut. We're not going to point out who you are. No one knows who you are. This is totally private, personal to you. We're not going to point you out. You don't have to repeat after me out loud. You don't have to do it out loud. Just say it inside. So I'll give you the opportunity to say to God that you repent and only believe in the blood to save you. I will give you that chance. I'm going to give you the words. Repeat after me. Here we go. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. I only believe in the blood to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would just bow your head, close your eyes one last time, one last time, just one minute and we're done. Just one minute and we're done. Thank you for your patience. I don't want to take up your time. So I want to wrap this up quickly. Okay. Now, if you just repeated those words after me, could you just slip up your hand real quick? Don't worry. I'm not going to point out who you are. No one knows who you are. This is totally private and personal. All I want to know is that somebody did just say those words. Somebody just got saved today so that I can give God the glory. Could you just slip up your hand just real briefly, real quick, and we're not going to point out who you are. No one's going to point out who you are. This is totally private, personal. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that you'll please dismiss us now with your blessing. Thank you so much for the truth of thy word. And I pray that today's preaching has convicted, changed people's lives. I pray we didn't get right with you today because of how we felt. I pray we got right with you because that's what your spirit wanted us to do. And that we will truly crucify the feelings of the flesh and make the spirit more alive than before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.